Hey guys, welcome back. Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and Mom24. Today we're going through some information on the novel coronavirus and COVID-19 in pregnancy and infants. Importantly, I am filming this on the morning of March 3rd, 2020. This information is changing very quickly, and some of the things that I say today may not even be applicable tomorrow. As always, this is not specific medical advice for you. This is information to give you a starting point, to give you better understanding, and to give you something to talk with your doctor about. It's super important that we get our information from reliable, non-sensationalized sources. I've linked below all the sources that I use to talk about the information today. All right, let's start here. I know there isn't much data on pregnant women and the virus, but any best guesses. First off, we need to start by saying, yes, that's absolutely accurate. We don't have a lot of data on this virus in general, and that means we don't have very much data at all in this virus in people who are pregnant. However, we do know a little bit about coronavirus in general. So corona comes from the Latin word halo or crown, and that just describes the shape of the virus a little bit, which is kind of interesting to me. I'll throw a picture up on the screen of what it looks like. This is a family of viruses that cause different kinds of infections, anything from the common cold, which most of us have probably had, to really severe illnesses like SARS and MERS. These are both viruses which are coronaviruses that have caused novel outbreaks like we're seeing now in the past, SARS in 2003, and MERS in 2012. Some of the information I give you today is necessarily going to be drawn from what we know for SARS and MERS in regards to people who were pregnant at that time or who had infants at that time. Okay, this question says, is it safe to have out-of-state family visit for a baby shower in the third trimester? I think for travel and visiting information, we really need to take this information straight from the CDC. Basically, if you have any symptoms of respiratory illness, you just shouldn't travel. Don't risk exposing other people. We're starting to see community spread, and that just doesn't make sense if you're sick. If you're not sick, then I think following the CDC guidelines, which are going to be rapidly changing about where it is safe to travel to is your best bet. I will link below the CDC website with an interactive map and also a running list of those places. I am 35 weeks pregnant. Am I more susceptible? Am I considered immunocompromised? My initial thought before I started researching this is that yes, pregnant women would be more susceptible. As I'm going through the available data, it doesn't seem that that's the case. Although importantly, we still don't know for sure. It seems like people who are pregnant are not at an increased risk of getting the disease. However, because this is still in the early stages, there were some publications that said we may see that start to change. Just because, yes, pregnancy is kind of an immunocompromised state. Importantly, that's not the same level of immunocompromise that you would see in someone who is undergoing chemotherapy for cancer treatment or who has a major immunocompromised disease like AIDS. Interestingly, similar to the MERS outbreak of 2012, we're really seeing more diagnoses in men. Is this because men are actually more susceptible or is it because of reporting or exposure or something like that? It's hard to say. You're going to see a theme developing through this whole video of it's still the early stages. We don't know for sure. But right now, it doesn't seem that pregnant women are at a drastically increased risk of being diagnosed with COVID-19. My mother-in-law insists I need a mask in public because I am pregnant. Is this true? Masks protect people from getting sick because of you not so much you getting sick because of other people. This is really important because I've seen that there is a shortage of masks for medical facilities. Part of that is presumed to be because people are buying them up. You should wear a mask if you have respiratory symptoms. If you are having symptoms, please wear a mask. If you're not having symptoms, please don't buy up these masks and hoard them. They're very important for healthcare professionals and for people who are ill. Being pregnant, other than hand washing, what can I do to protect myself and baby? The answer to this question really goes back to that last one of minimizing exposure. For pregnant people, I don't think this is any different than just for the average person. Hand washing, do it right, do it often. Hand washing with good technique is warm soapy water for at least 20 seconds. 
If you're going to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, it needs to be at least 60% to kill this virus. That and avoiding people who may be sick are the best things that you can do to protect yourself as someone who is pregnant or as someone who is not pregnant. And then if you're going to be out with an infant, keep them covered, don't let people touch them. Is it more serious to get the COVID-19 while pregnant and does it also depend on the trimester? This is another hard question to answer, but from preliminary data that we have right now, which really consists of about 18 pregnant people in two different studies, and all of that data is coming from China, it does not right now seem to be that pregnant people have a worse disease course than people who are not pregnant. In a recent article published in The Lancet, their quote on this was that the disease course for people who are pregnant is, quote, relatively optimistic clinical course and outcomes for COVID-19 infection compared to SARS-CoV-1 in pregnant people. Meaning, if you compare outcomes with this COVID-19 to the SARS coronavirus one that we saw in 2003, outcomes seem to be better now. So that's reassuring. And then the second part of that question was, is it dependent on trimester? We don't have much information on earlier trimester disease course for COVID-19. 18 people, nine in each study, and they all were in the third trimester at the time of presentation. So I think we have to wait to answer that question as far as what happens in different trimesters. If we look at data from SARS in 2003, there were some cases in early pregnancy that were associated with miscarriage. The study I was reading only had seven people with early trimester SARS to give us information on. So obviously that's a very small sample size to look at and decide what is your actual risk. If you are pregnant and get the coronavirus, do you and baby have an increased chance of death? So again, we only have 18 cases that we can draw on right now, but out of those 18 cases of pregnant people with COVID-19, there were no maternal deaths. At a bare minimum, that should be very reassuring. The SARS virus in 2003 seemed to have about a 25% death rate in pregnant people, which was higher than the 10% that the virus was causing in people who weren't pregnant. The data for MERS was similar, a death rate for pregnant people of about 23%, which was significantly less than the 35% that you were seeing in people who weren't pregnant. I think part of this comes down to both of these viruses and the virus we're seeing now have a predilection for people who are older and who have more comorbid health conditions. And people who are pregnant have a tendency to fall into categories of being a little bit younger and a little bit healthier. Importantly, I think underlying health conditions in someone who is pregnant are still going to exacerbate the severity of the illness and potentially increase the risk of mortality. But as it is right now, we haven't seen any deaths in pregnant patients from COVID-19. Can it cause birth defects or pose threats to the baby? As I researched this, I didn't find any indication that any coronavirus have been associated with any type of fetal malformations. I think there's likely an increased risk of complications in pregnancy, things like risk of preterm labor, risk of preterm delivery, and risk of fetal distress necessitating delivery. The two studies we have on people who have this disease while they're pregnant are a little bit varied in the outcomes that we're seeing. One of them had very, very good fetal outcomes and one of them was a little bit less reassuring. I think this is just a large unknown right now. What is the treatment when you're pregnant? The treatment for COVID-19 is largely supportive care right now. We don't have a treatment. We are using some other antiviral medications to experimentally try and treat this disease. And we are giving antibiotics to prevent overlapping bacterial infections, but we don't have a treatment for this illness. As far as vaccination goes, the process of developing a vaccine takes a very long time. There is a group out of Houston who is making great headway on this because they were able to use a SARS vaccine that never went into actual production because we didn't end up needing it, but they can draw on that to hopefully expedite the development of this vaccine. It is still one or two years away, I think, because there is lots of safety testing that goes into vaccines and it won't be released until it's been adequately tested for FDA approval. So we won't have it during this outbreak, but we will potentially have it if there are future outbreaks of this same 
coronavirus. Safe medicine to take or homeopathic remedies. I've seen this all over Instagram and all over Facebook and all over Twitter, people saying elderberry and they're selling supplements and immune boosters and all these things. There's no evidence that this will help you. And people who are trying to make a buck on selling things to you based on your fear of this disease are shameful. They should be embarrassed and that is disgusting. Should we be as concerned about Corona as we were of Zika? Zika virus was more of a fetal risk. There were really severe fetal malformations related to Zika virus. And we're not really seeing that with this novel coronavirus. I think that the concern about COVID-19 should be different than the concern about Zika virus. This disease is going to be the effects on the pregnant person and not the fetal effects. Should I cancel my flight to Florida with my less than two year old in two weeks due to the virus? For travel guidance, we need to go to the CDC and local health authorities. Right now, the CDC has lots of good information about where you should travel, where you shouldn't, where you should be cautious. And I think following their guidelines is super important. I wanna reiterate again, if you have any symptoms of any illness, please don't get on a plane. In the off chance that it ended up being this novel coronavirus, you have exposed a whole lot of people. The best thing we can do to prevent the spread of this virus is to stay home if we are sick. Can it infect the fetus through the placenta? So fetal transmission was not reported in SARS or MERS, and we don't seem to have seen it in the COVID-19 either. The two studies that I was talking about, one of them looked at amniotic fluid, cord blood, and then tested the neonate after delivery and didn't seem to find any evidence of vertical transmission, which is from mom to baby through placenta. I think we're still not 100% sure on that, but preliminary data says probably not vertically transmitted. Another really good question was about breastfeeding. And the guidance right now on breastfeeding is that in a patient who has been diagnosed with COVID-19, they should probably be separated from the neonate while they are ill and while they are contagious. There hasn't been any evidence of breast milk transmission of the disease, but there is questionable evidence that the antibodies or protection against the disease is transmitted in breast milk. Until there's further information that says we shouldn't breastfeed, the current guidance from American Journal of OBGYN's publication is that Mothers who are sick with COVID-19 and in a state where they can express breast milk and they want to express breast milk to feed to the infant can do so. But that breastfeeding at the breast in someone who is directly contagious should be avoided until symptoms are better and the risk of transmission to the neonate has gone away. What symptoms should I be alert with infants? Are they the same as adults? So as of February 6th, when this data was published, they looked at 31,000 cases that they could review in China at that time. And out of those 31,000 cases, there were only nine diagnoses in infants less than one year old. Out of those nine infants, a couple of them were completely asymptomatic and the others had really mild respiratory cold-like symptoms. They were all hospitalized and they all fully recovered. That I think is really reassuring in regards to the risk to really young children. Is it safe to take my two week old out like to stores and stuff? Again, just drawing on that obviously very small sample size of the nine infants that they had diagnosed, out of all of those who were diagnosed with the COVID-19, all of them had an immediate family member who also was diagnosed except for one who had been potentially directly exposed to someone with the disease. Right now, the evidence looks like most of the cases that were transmitted to infants have been directly from a family member who was diagnosed with the illness. If you need to take your baby out, keep the baby covered, don't let people touch him or her, and just use normal precautions like we were talking about earlier. Why does it seem to be infecting babies less than normal infections? With the data we have right now, it does seem that infants and young children, especially under the age of nine, are at much lower risk of both getting COVID-19 and having serious problems from COVID-19. Infants tend to be at a little bit higher risk of major disease from things like influenza, so why is this not as bad? I don't know that we know that for sure. There is some theory that the respiratory receptors that this virus binds to are not as mature in children and so you just can't get the disease as easily. 
And then there's some that say maybe they just fight it off more easily and that they're getting it at the same rates, but they're just completely asymptomatic. I don't think we know that 100%. Has anyone recovered from it? If my baby gets it, is it a death sentence? 80% of everybody that's been diagnosed with this disease has had mild disease and has fully recovered. There are major morbidities associated with the disease and people have a tendency to get very, very sick if they have it, but still most of those are recovering. The death rate right now seems to be about one to 2% and that may even be an overestimate as we see some more asymptomatic cases get diagnosed. For children, like we talked about, it seems to be much, much lower than that. It's definitely not a death sentence. I think that as Dr. Mike has said, over and over in his videos. We need to be alert, but not anxious. We need to be taking precautions and we need to be aware of the information, which is why a lot of us are out here trying to give you good information, but we don't need to panic. We just need to keep our ears and eyes open to the CDC, the World Health Organization, and local health authorities and physicians as much as we can. What are you changing in your day-to-day -day practice with regards to the virus? Not a lot has changed in day-to-day -day practice. I would say I'm doing a little bit more educated. We're doing a lot more screening and I'm just talking to people about hand washing and just general illness prevention precautions a little bit more. Do you know if surviving this virus can cause infertility? I don't think we have any way of knowing that right now. We don't have any indication from previous illnesses that that should be a concern, but it's too early to answer questions like that, I think. I think the biggest take home message is we need to be aware, but we don't need to panic. Try to live your daily life as normal as possible until we're told otherwise by local health authorities. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If it helped you out, I would really appreciate you sharing it on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else that it could help someone who doesn't have this information. Check out Dr. Mike's videos. He's done an excellent job going through this and he does such a good job of relaying this information in a way that is super informational and very reliable, but not sensationalized. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. I would love for you to stay. If you're following me on Instagram, there will be more Q and A's in the future. So feel free to leave your questions over there when they come up. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.